All right. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome to today's webinar on scaling developer efforts with the Salesforce Marketing Cloud. Thank you for joining. We're very excited to share this information with you today. I'm Nisha Bakshi, and I'm on the developer marketing team at Salesforce. Today, we're joined by Dave Hacker, a senior product manager specializing in data in the Salesforce Marketing Cloud. Prior to Salesforce, Dave was a Salesforce client and held various software product and engineering roles. He attended Purdue and holds an MBA from Epitech in Paris. Next, we have Don Owens, the Director of Product Management on the Content and Personalization team. And he recently celebrated his five-year anniversary at Salesforce. Don has 25 years of experience as an engineer, product manager in retail, marketing, and e-commerce. And finally, we're joined by Alan Holm, PM for Transactional and API Messaging at Salesforce Marketing Cloud. Prior to Salesforce, Alan owned real-time data streaming products at Teradata and developed electronic systems as a lead engineer at AMD. We're also thrilled to let our developers and partners know about the Marketing Cloud Developer Center, a new landing page with links to important developer documentation, SDKs, a Marketing Cloud trail, and Stack Exchange. Now, both new and veteran Marketing Cloud developers can find useful links in one prominent spot without having to browse through the left nav. Please visit developer.salesforce.com slash devcenter slash marketing cloud. Next slide. Feel free to ask questions at any time during the presentation using GoToWebinar's question window. We will be answering as many questions as we can live during the Q&A session at the end of the webinar. And with that, we're ready to get started with today's session, Scaling Developer Efforts with Salesforce Marketing Cloud. Take it away. OK, hi, this is Dave Hacker. Um, I will be walking you through the first portion of this, as you see on the agenda, the building your data model. Uh, then that's a nice transition once we have all the data we need in there. Um, I will transition to Don on the content block SDK. And finally, Alan's going to wrap up with the transactional messaging portion. Um, they'll be about 15 minutes each. So let me get started with building your data model. So agenda for this specific part, <laughs> steps to creating a data model. Um, I'll walk you through the beginning to get the data in there, and then we're really going to focus on code versus clicks. Um, we'll dive into why, why there, and then I say a deep dive on data model steps. Uh, not sure how deep we can get here, but I'll try to at least go a, a, a level deeper. And then, of course, if you need any, any uh, details, we'll have the Q and A at the end. So. Building your data model, this is the journey you're going to be taking um, as you set up your data model within the Marketing Cloud and probably very many products, um, but uh, some Marketing Cloud specific vocabulary you'll, you'll see here, starting at the bottom of the mountain here uh, with setting up your data extensions. So those, um, I know we've got a mixed crowd here, so data extensions are simply tables hold, holding data, you know, extending the data that you need for the Marketing Cloud to meet your use cases. So we're going to set those up. I'll walk through steps on how to do that. Um, then setting up contacts. Now, contacts has a different meaning in the marketing cloud than maybe the sales or service cloud. Um, contacts is a separate area um, where you'll be able to see the kind of 360 view of the customer. Um, and obviously, that relates really closely to setting up your data extensions. Now, setting up core data. By core, I mean sales and service. Uh, oftentimes, we have use cases uh, such as lead conversion journeys, where you're going to want to get not just the data flowing over, but you're going to want the schema behind that data. So we, we think of that as kind of a schema as the plumbing, everything you need, and then the water comes flowing through the plumbing uh, when it's the actual data as leads are converting, and that would you know uh, relate to your marketing cloud journeys. So then to get that water flowing in there, we're going to import the data. Uh, then the fun part, but that's when I'll probably be transitioning over to Don for the content. Uh, but uh, we'll be starting at the bottom of the mountain here to, to get you on your way to building your journeys. So starting out with setting up your data extensions. Clicks or code? We could show you either way. Um, since this is more of a developer-focused, more technical webinar, we'll be focusing more on code. But uh, everything we do here is API first. We try to make everything available via code. Uh, I may be demonstrating it with clicks because it's just a little bit 
a little easier to demo. Uh, but you'll see every step of the way, you don't have to pick either or, you could even switch from clicks to code if you run into limitations or vice versa if you find that clicks are an easier part. So here's why, this is not just because it's a developer webinar, um, but code has a few advantages. Uh, it saves you time if you're setting up, we have customers with hundreds of business units in the marketing cloud. Uh, Obviously, setting up one business unit wouldn't be that big a deal to do with clicks, but if you're able to do this with code, that can save you a lot of time by just scripting it and then running that same script against several different BUs. Uh, of course, automation makes it easier. This is similar to the BU, uh, that when you're deciding on how to get a, a business unit set up, which is similar to an org on the, on the, uh, the sales and service cloud, um, but it, it's less error prone, so if you've got a script, it'll run the same thing, it's every business unit, and so same thing if you've got a, you've scripted a change you want in your sandbox, you test it, everything looks good, then you can easily deploy that out to your non-sandbox production business units using code. Finally, Marketing Cloud is API first, as are a lot of well-written products, so behind the scenes you'll find that you, you can inspect the elements that are painted on the screen, you'll see they're painted by the same APIs you'll be using. Um, it is a superset of the UI, meaning, you know, obviously the inverse is true. The UI is a subset of the API. Um, so the API is a bit more powerful, so you may run into um, some limitations where it would be great to get around those limitations using the API where there's more flexibility. Finally, looks better on your resume. So uh, I'm sure you all have pretty good resumes in this crowd. So step one, we're at the bottom of the mountain here. Um, we, we know the data we need, but we need to set that data up, set up that plumbing in the marketing cloud. So that's what we call data extensions, again. So it's just data tables that are gonna hold the data, use the power of the journeys and other sends. So how do you create data extensions? Relatively straightforward. So the link we have here, and we'll be sharing these slides out, um, or just go to developer.salesforce.com. It's easy enough to find the APIs to create data extensions in the marketing cloud. Uh, if you are going the clicks route, simple enough, you just create a new data extension, and as you can see here, it's simply a table. So a uh, little bit small here, but you see, you know, pick your different types of your columns, like you've got a text column, a number, a date, et cetera, whether it's required, the length of that field, default values, um, even along the top, you see data retention policy and, and other properties. Uh, again, this is all, the, the API is a superset, so everything that's accessible here is accessible uh, via the API. Little tip, um, you've got different ways you can set up data in the marketing cloud. There is a simple way to get set up using lists, but if you're just getting started, I'd recommend starting with data extensions. It's definitely a best practice, and you'll find that you'll run into limitations over lists after a while. There's, there's no limits on attributes in the data extension where you will bump into limits with lists. Um, if you're already on lists, you can simply create a, you can, you can switch over or for your newer marketing campaigns, start using data extensions. Uh, and as we say here, optimize for custom queries. Um, it's just a lot more customizable. So I definitely recommend going the data extension route. That's certainly the, the future of the marketing cloud. So on to step two, climbing up that mountain. Um, now you've got your data extensions in the marketing cloud. So we're going from step one and we're going to link it into the contact model. Uh, so if those of you familiar with the marketing cloud, you've got your 360 degree view of the contact, you've got what we call our constellation view, which is how all this data relates to one another. Um, we don't, so this is just a, a quick visual. So out of the box, you're going to see some some data set up for you, some of the plumbing set up for you, but of course we want a power of the market cloud or Salesforce in general, as you can customize it to your needs. So this is an example of a real customer who added in extensions and then linked them into the contact model. Um, I believe one of these is a shopping cart even. And so you don't, yes, you care about what's in the cart, but more specifically, you care about what's in the cart for a specific customer. So you can, you can retarget them. Um, so that's why you relate it back to the contact so that we know when we're doing a journey, a decision split, or segmenting for an audience, you'll have all the data you need to connect it back to the, to the contact. 
So this is just a similar to what we do with data extensions. This is what it looks like from the UI if we're going the clicks route to set up the contact model. Um, you can browse to an existing data extension or create a new one and then show how it links back. So uh, the use case we've got here, just to, so you can visualize, is we've got a customer that wants to send emails and texts, so a, a multi-channel journey for fans of a specific artist without writing SQL. We do have options to even write SQL if you want. And if that's the case, look into query activities. But if you want our drag and drop segmentation, um, then you're going to want to link it into the contact model. And so again, we don't care about just preferences on their own. We care about preferences for specific fans. So we, we take our fans data extension and link it as a, you know, a fan might have many different preferences of, uh, of artists they enjoy. So that you just simply link it into the contact model and flipping back, then you'll see it show up here and you'll be able to use it in your journeys. So that's set up, especially for custom items, but what if you already have this set up over in the sales and service model? Um, so the, the core side of things, um, which many of you might be more familiar with. Great, you've already got it set up, so simply sync it in with the marketing pub. So this is for cross-cloud use cases. I mentioned earlier lead conversion journeys. So let's say a sales lead converts, or an opportunity converts, um, you wanna create that lead, well, you want that to flow into marketing so you can market to that lead. Fairly straightforward. So you set up the sync with the marketing cloud. Now I do wanna highlight this is one area where the API is not exposed. So you do have to go through a wizard to sync with the marketing cloud and you simply click the objects that you want to bring over and it brings over both the plumbing and the water, right? So it brings over, in my example, the lead conversion, it brings over the lead object any other fields you want, um, if you're offering discounts, pricing information, product information, anything that's stored over in sales, we'll set up a wizard to sync that over into the marketing cloud. Um, it supports all of the out of the box standard objects, the S objects that you'd have over in core, as well as any custom objects that you've added. So it syncs the schema, um, it auto adds everything. So every the steps we showed before, creating data extensions, linking it into the contact model, it takes care of all that for you. And finally, once we've got all the plumbing ready, it starts syncing that data over to the marketing cloud. That comes over a minimum every 15 minutes. Uh, and then there's actually some real-time options for Salesforce uh, available in Journey Builder as well. Little tip on Salesforce data, less is more. Um, oftentimes we have customers using the sales side as their system of record, so they don't need to bring everything over into marketing cloud. Um, we do let you select everything. Um, and this is actually a be behind the scenes, this is actually what it actually looks like to our developers, where they've seen that they're linking in their contacts, their accounts, their bookings, uh, they're linking them in to the marketing cloud, and that data is syncing over. Well, we had one, this is a real customer use case. We've, we've so look at how this is a pretty simple model supporting the use cases. One customer decided to check everything, so then they noticed it was taking more than 15 minutes to sync data over, we realized that they were syncing way more data over than they actually needed. So just a little tip, uh, make sure you actually need that data before you sync it over. So Marketing Cloud is a blank sheet. Um, a little, I wanna to touch on roadmap a little bit here. Um, so what we wanna offer is an out of the box model. We'll always expect you to extend it. We wanna keep it as customizable as, as we can to meet all your needs. But a lot of things like First name, last name, let's provide more of that out of the box. Um, you, you will get some out of the box, but we want more so you can really hit the ground running and, and dive into what's specific to your business versus something every customer is going to have to do. So this, just like everything, is going to be shipped with all the APIs, UX, and, and best practices needed to get, get you up and running quickly, climbing that mountain. Um, we're aligning with the core data model, uh, so their canonical data models, which will really make the cross cut cloud use case is much simpler since it will match uh, the data in the marketing cloud will match what you're seeing on the sales and service side. And then we're offering up to partners something this audience might be very interested in, uh, industry data models, as well as letting partners extend the model and offer those models up on App Exchange. So if you build something that, let's say you're, you've got a lot of FinServe customers that might have similar needs, you can upload that to App Exchange and offer that to our customers' customers, our, our mutual customers. So wrapping up here, um, so next steps, 
Uh, there's a couple trail mod mod modules that I personally found very interesting on powering your marketing with first part of data, as well as data quality. And again, a, a developer at salesforce.com is, is a great resource for all these APIs. And, and yeah, hit us up on the Q&A at the end for, for this session as well. All right, now I'm gonna turn it over to Don. Uh, so now you've got all this data in there. So uh, Don will, will tell you how you can set up the content in the marketing cloud. Thanks, Dave. Uh, hi, everyone again. Uh, my name is Don Owens. I am a director of product management on the uh, marketing cloud on the content team. And so what I want to talk to you today about is the um, marketing cloud content block SDK. Uh, so let's uh, just do to set a little bit of groundwork here. Um, we have a, a, a content system within the marketing cloud called Content Builder. And within that, uh, within Content Builder, um, users use that to store content, uh, build emails, build web pages, um, and then messages for other types of channel. Uh, what we're talking about today is our editor for uh, web pages and emails, and you can see a, a small screenshot of it here on uh, on this slide. And um, uh, what what do I mean when I say a content block? So in this screenshot, you can see on the left side of the page um, they're they're really small, but they're there. Um, we have these blocks for things like uh, for buttons and for text and for images, so basic things like that. And users drag these blocks onto their email to construct an email. Um, and then we also have advanced content like dynamic content. Uh, we have Einstein content. We have image carousels. We have live content, things like that. Um, but we know that this isn't always sufficient for what people want to include in a, an email or a web page. So. Uh, from the very beginning, when we started building Content Builder, we had this intent for it to be an extensible platform. So uh, this is finally a reality now. So we, we've released this SDK uh, that allows um, developers with our ISV partners, uh, developers and services teams, and even developers for clients to use this SDK to build their own blocks to use uh, while building an email or a web page. Um, so what you can do here is um, virtually uh, unlimited in any use case where you want to add content to an email. So we have situations with ISV partners like Movable Inc and Live Clicker and Pixly um, who have created their own blocks that are distributed in the App Exchange uh, that are a direct link to their application. So uh, let's say if you use Movable Inc to create a countdown timer to an event, uh, instead of logging into Movable Inc's application, creating your countdown timer there, copying the, the HTML that they generate and pasting it into your HTML, you can sim simply drag the movable link block into your email, select that countdown timer, and it's added to, the, uh, to your email. Um, in addition to that, we have customers that are using this, uh, scenarios where customers have, have created their own blocks um, that, that do either very specific things like connecting to an internal CMS to, say, grab images to include in a campaign, um, or to create uh, a customized workflow. Um, you know, they, they maybe don't like the flexibility that our out-of-the-box blocks uh, provide to them, so they may do something like create their own text block that limits the font choices and the color choices and the size choices uh, just to keep their users on brand and on message. Um, so it's, it's really, it's fairly wide open um, for, for customers and partners to use. And so let's talk a little bit about how uh, how this all works. Um, essentially, a custom block is uh, some ap application, uh, you know, a small application that is running outside of the marketing cloud, uh, either in on some platform like Heroku or AWS, uh, or if it's for an ISV partner like Movable Link, it's an application that is running in their cloud. Um, and so what happens is once one of these these applications is provisioned into the marketing cloud as a block that application is exposed in the editor uh, via an iframe, and it looks like a, a native block. Um, and our SDK allows that, that application then to communicate with the editor to get and set content within blocks uh, within an email or a web page. Um, it does this all via cross-document sharing, uh, so you're not making round trips to an API um, every time you, you type a letter or update content. So it happens quickly, uh, it appears to be seamless, uh, as we'll see here in a moment when I do a quick demo. Um, and so it's, it's really, it's pretty simple. 
there are a handful of methods out there right now, I believe five methods, uh, but we have more coming in subsequent releases to allow you to have more control um, and then also providing examples of how to authenticate against, say, the content API if you want your custom block to maybe make selections for images from uh, the content repository and content builder. And so uh, before I get to the demo, uh, this slide, we have a, a links to a few resources uh, available. The, um, there's a link to the GitHub repo that has the SDK code base on it. Um, there is a, uh, a testing application that allows you to test your custom block before you actually deploy it into your account uh, so you can you know test it out make sure everything's cool before you uh, put it into production and then there's developer documentation on the developer help site so with that uh, let's go ahead and jump over to a quick demo and I'll show you some custom blocks in action so I'm in the content builder editor uh, I have an email open here that has a just a, a blank template here on the page and so as I was describing earlier we see some basic blocks like text and images in here. Um, we see some advanced content, uh, as I mentioned, dynamic content, Einstein content, and image carousels. We have some social media blocks. And I have a handful of custom blocks here in uh, my email. So let's say I want to build a, an email to uh, invite people to Dreamforce this year. Um, and I know I have some images that uh, are Salesforce approved images. They're uh, in a WordPress CMS um, that, that we use on my team. And so we, we have this custom block that links to our uh, WordPress site. And so I can do a few things in here. Um, but I, what I want to point out is um, this is actually an application that is running on Heroku. Uh, it's not a marketing cloud application. Uh, it's just a simple web page um, that does some things as I, uh, as I make changes here in the left side of the page, they update on the right. So. Um, I have this image library in here. I want to look for some Salesforce images. So I see some of these. That's the one I want. That doesn't look great. Let's make it fill the whole page. Okay, we're good there. Um, and then, uh, you know, let's say I want to add some text in here. Um, I'll add it later, but I'm going to go ahead and drop a text block into the page uh, as a placeholder. And then uh, let's include a map to uh, Moscone Center because everyone wants to know how to get to, to Dreamforce. Uh, so we have this custom Google map block that we built. Um, when I drop it on the page, uh, it will load and it will load. <laughs> there we go. I, I think my Heroku app went to sleep. Um, so this block is just a simple little uh, widget that uh, my team created, um, runs on Heroku. And if I type in something like uh, Moscone Center, oops, if I don't misspell it, and what I see on the right is, um, as I type there, this this block is hitting the Google Maps API, and it found the map to Moscone Center. Uh, I want to adjust the size so it fills the page a little better. Um, so I know that this is 580 pixels. So we'll go ahead and do that. That looks good. And if I wanted to add a link here, so when people click on this. I can type in the link to Dreamforce. And there we go. So pretty simple, uh, just demonstrated there. Uh, had those two applications. We have some others in here that we build as uh, examples, and we also see our partner uh, movable links block in here as well. That's available on the App Exchange. Uh, so with that, I will turn things over to Alan to talk about transactional messaging. Great, thank you. Hi, everybody. My name's Alan. I'm the product manager for, for transactional messaging. And today we're going to be talking about a bit of a deep dive on our current transactional APIs, um, future transactional APIs, uh, where we're investing, and um, use cases that primarily drive transactional messaging. So jump right in. So first, we're going to talk about transactional messaging and what it means to your brand. So let's first baseline and talk about what is a transactional message. So we identify a transactional message as something that's initiated by a person and it, it doesn't have a promotional goal. And in fact, affirms the completion of a process and you expect to have that immediately in real time. So a good example of this is two-factor authentication, password resets, you just um, order something online, you wanna see right away that you got that order. 
Another way that we identify transactional messaging is that it can be initiated by a third party system. Uh, but again, it's not promotional. So this means that um, you effectively opted in to some sort of a reminder um, or an alert and you need to be notified of that right away. Again, real time use cases. And in terms of the users that we're focusing on for transactional messaging, um, there is very much a developer heavy focus here. And so you heard previously Dave talk a lot about developers and it's the same around transactional messaging because it's important for integration. And so we want to ensure that we're enabling developers with the right experience for them to bring their, their transactional use cases online rapidly. But we want to do that without alienating a very large uh, marketing and content creator base. So again, we want to ensure that there's consistent user experiences and valuable user experiences between these uh, these two personas. And then on the right, obviously, we are focused on the executives finding value out of getting utilizing transactional messages through the marketing cloud and enabling our customers, customer service organizations so that, for example, if you got a a two-factor authentication, there was an error, a customer might have requested it, you need the ability to go in and actually identify what happened with that particular message. Um, and so we want to enable those users as well. So let's talk about the power of transactional messages and, and what it means for your brand. Um, transactional messages almost always have very high engagement. I mean, it's upwards of about 95% because you asked for that. And so this isn't something that you're checking on periodically. I mean, you, you requested this as a person, you're expecting it to come based on a reminder. And so it always has very high engagement. And it is the epitome of what is a one-to-one -one engagement because it's the user asked for this specific to what it is that they were, their transaction uh, consisted of. And so therefore it's, it's very much one-to-one. -one. Uh, what you may not have considered is that it's an opportunity to do more than just provide information about the transaction. But it's an opportunity to include follow-ups and offer feedback uh, or suggest following on social media. And it really helps to extend the visibility of your brand because of this. So here's some interesting data that was collected across a um, little over 100 or organizations um, through the CMO Council. They interviewed several CMOs. And um, those who believe that uh, transactional emails are opportunities to reinforce relationships, only 36%. So there's, there's a good two-thirds who haven't yet identified that there is an opportunity to further, relate, to further relationships. And we want to ensure that we are showing that there is that capability. Um, and also 30% deploy to only affirm choices and not to further relationships. And so when we talk about extending your brand through transactional messages, again, there's a huge opportunity here in order to take advantage of that. One thing too that we've uh, noticed is that there can sometimes be a disconnect between the teams that are actually deploying um, the transactional emails and the teams that are trying to set what the, the branding language is, what the content should be. And so again, there are interesting and significant numbers here to help the overall collaboration and help the time to market and time to value of getting your transactional systems in place. So what are we offering today with our transactional and messaging API? I mean, the power of doing your transactional messaging through the marketing cloud is that it complements what you have in place for marketing, what you have in place for automations and journeys. Uh, you can maintain that 360 view of a contact, both in what they're, how they are prescribed in a journey, um, as well as how, what their interactions are from a, uh, from a transactional user. Uh, we offer multiple channels of engagement. So uh, as you're aware um, or may not be aware, we have um, email, SMS, push notifications, and we've recently uh, brought forward OTT as well as channels of engagement. And ultimately then um, through all of these channels, you can interact with the shared audiences for each channels along with the content management that is offered for these channels. And ultimately this reduces your cost to serve by operating all of this under one hood. Salesforce has, we have platform uh, uptime SLAs and we are a leader in uh, B2C engagement. And uh, those of you who have worked with our support teams know that we do have uh, wonderful world-class support teams. So let's get into the details about the exact, uh, what we exactly have today for our APIs. So first uh, we have SOAP for our email sending. 
And this exists today. It's a very mature way of um, implementing your transactional methods. Um, it's a triggered send object in SOAP using the create method, but we also have REST options as well. And REST is how you interact with the other channels like SMS and push. And we also have a route for email. Um, and that's through a resource called message definition sends. And for SMS, it's message contact and is similar to push. Um, you can actually invoke these as well through AMP script using the triggered send. If you want to implement a triggered send, there's something called invoke create function, or if you want to interact with the uh, with the REST APIs, you can also use the HTT POST or HTT POST2 functions in AMP script. And so this is traditionally used for landing pages in the marketing cloud. So those are what we have today. However, it goes without saying that more is better and innovation is better and customers are asking for more, you are asking for more. Uh, you're asking for easier integration, SOAP, SOAP is um, somewhat becoming less and less relevant, whereas REST endpoints are becoming more relevant. You're asking for predictability. Um, you want to understand exactly what's happening with that transactional message as soon as you send it out, and you want to be notified in near real time on the status of that. It's very important in transactional messaging. And higher performance as well. Um, this isn't commercial sense. This, this kind of lives as, as its own. Um, you know, has its own SLOs because of the urgency and the ex expectation for neo real-time engagement. And there's just a plethora of features as well that we think we can um, invest in. And so we are uh, investing in five core areas. Um, first is accelerating our sending. So um, in the next few releases, we'll be um, offering some APIs that I'm going to cover here in a bit that um, are rebuilt with the intention for transactional sending. Easier to integrate, uh, easier to consume the disposition of that message. And these APIs are very much developer focused. So we want to ensure that we're supplying you with optimized SDKs, with documentation, with in-application queues, and even code examples when you're configuring your, your transactional messages, being able to, to take advantage of hints and um, code examples to integrate right in. And across channels, today you, you go through the different studios um, to set up your outbound transactional messages, uh, also known as triggered messages. Uh, we are consolidating that experience and under one API resource and in general over one user experience. Documentation and UI will all coalesce into a single experience. And when we talk about these transactional messages are very operational in nature, and therefore you need dashboards and tools in order to understand what's happening with that send. And so moving forward, we're gonna be providing that instrumentation and dashboards and notifications for you to understand exactly what's going on with your sends um, beyond the scope of just engagement, specifically about um, what is my API request rates? What are my error rates? Why aren't these emails going out? What are some statistics about that? Uh, and we're redoing this all this on our existing scalable platform with optimizations in place. So our new APIs that we are currently building out, they are not available. They are going through a piloting process. And I will put a plug in here at this time to say, if you are interested in um, jumping on the pilot, uh, please reach out to your account rep and uh, we'll work with you and vet your use cases to see if you think this is interesting. But first is that we really took to heart ensuring that we're providing a RESTful experience from an API level and a unified experience. So the idea is that you have this concept of a definition, which is what you templateize in order to send again. So you have your content information in there, you have your list and your data, your triggered send data extensions, and any sort of options about adding subscribers and managing attributes. Um, you, you can operate, run CRUD operations on this the same way across email and SMS. So you can see that it's accessed by uh, the resource name and then the specific channel. So email or SMS will have shared uh, resource uh, uh, resources on which to operate on. And then for those of you who are familiar with email, we do have queuing. And so when these deactivate, you'll be able to now get your counts of your queues through your API. Uh, to understand you know, when we're still accepting requests, but you didn't want to continue processing. So now you'll be able to both count the queue and clear the queue. 
And then as for sending, we're bringing that paradigm as well, the way you define definitions across channel in a very unified way. Um, we are bringing that as well to sending. So you'll be able to send messages and we've added this new attribute called message key and it's basically a way for you to track the lineage of that message uh, as it gets sent out through the system. So from a tracking perspective, you can both get on this resource ID, this message key to understand, okay, what happened to this? For example, a customer agent were to try to identify what's happening. He might interact with a dashboard that says, okay, I know the message key that this went out with. Let me see what the status of that was. Why didn't he get his password reset? Um, as well, we are going to be providing web hooks with this uh, new service. So uh, these are also new endpoints. And so not only are we offering the ability to query the system for the status of a send, a transactional send, but also we will push that, we will stream those send events to a callback URL that you stand up. And we actually um, want to set the precedent that that is in fact the most optimal way for you to get your, your send dispositions because it's much easier to be sending that to a callback to you um, and you, you're not subject to having to manage batches and paginations. You can consume that at your own rate as long as you're listening for those callback events. So let me show you an example. This is a very distilled example uh, for me to get it to fit on the page, but I wanna show you the consistency moving forward that we are offering on our transactional sending APIs um, in three steps. So the first is you create an email definition and you can see that um, when I'm creating this definition, I give it my customer key from Content Builder I give it a definition key, which is the way I'm going to send against that particular content moving forward. And I can also put in, for example, a list, and I don't have in here, but a data extension as well, if I wanted to um, update a subscriber list, um, as well as have this information pushed into a data extension at the send. My next step would be to set up a subscription uh, endpoint through the callbacks. And so you can see in the middle of that command there, something called transactional send events. And I can listen for email sent, email not sent, and email bounce. So every time a particular message key changes state, um, let's say it was sent, but then it comes back a few minutes later and it's bounced, you will get those events streamed to you. And then ultimately sending the events. So now what I do is I reuse that definition key that I just created and I, I can either specify a message key, or in this case, I didn't. And it's very easy to send. All I have to do is know who I'm sending it to and whatever personalization attributes I had previously defined in my content. And so this is for email. And going into SMS, the design paradigm is nearly identical. There's a few caveats that are specific to each channel. And that is um, something that is just unique to SMS versus unique to email. But overall, the reuse of objects and the reuse of attributes between the channels is much greater than what we had previously. And so we want to increase your, increase your, your time to value, decrease your time to market, basically, by giving you this consistent RESTful API on which to interact with. And it's the same three steps, whether you were doing email or whether you were doing SMS or any other channel moving forward. So, um, Currently, you can learn about our, our SOAP and our existing REST endpoints through our developer documentation page. Um, if you want to jump into the triggered send scenario, for example, you can look at um, the specifics about triggered sends, SOAP and RESTful triggered sends. Uh, as well, we'll be moving this information and the new APIs into our beta API Explorer, which can also be found through the developer page. Thank you, and uh, do let me know if you have any questions. Great, thank you. And I know that um, Valerie has been pinging the um, the GoToWebinar. So if you have um, any feedback, we'd love to hear um, from you. So please make sure to uh, answer our survey. And um, with that, we'd love to take some questions. Um, the first question is for Dave. Do you have sandboxes for Marketing Cloud? My rep says that we have to do everything in production. This creates problems because we use sandboxes for sales and service cloud. Yeah, the, so I did. I touched on that a little bit in my presentation, which probably led to this question. Uh, so uh, we do not have the robust sandbox, sandbox cap capability that you will find with sales and service. Um, what we do have, and I'm speaking specifically to Dave, data model is different business units that get their own unique schema. So often 
in enterprise accounts that have multiple business units, what they'll do is create a new business unit, which is technically in production. Uh, then they will add, let's say, a new field as a simple example. Start sinking into that field, set up a journey. The journeys are versioned. So you can try test out a new version of a journey before going live with it. Uh, and then when all looks good, you would promote those changes from the sandbox business unit to what I'm calling the sandbox business unit to the other business units where you want that change applied. Great, thank you. Next question for Dave again. How hard is it to determine directionally in sync based on specific fields within an object? It's very easy. Um, the, the sync that I demonstrated is one way. So it's coming from sales and service into the marketing cloud. Now Marketing Cloud Connect does have more robust functionality uh, beyond the sync that I did demonstrated, but the data stream sync, the sync where you pick the, you walk through the wizard uh, to go from marketing cloud, from, sorry, from sales and service to marketing is one way. Uh, it does not go back the other direction from marketing into sales and service. What is the best way to integrate SFMC with Health Cloud? Does MC Connector work? Uh, similar to the last question, uh, so you, if you're syncing from sales and service or like a subset of that, so health cloud, uh, then that you would use marketing cloud connect to connect those to, to connect the clouds. But best way kind of begs the question, you know, what are you trying to do? What's your use cases? What's your timing? The sync I demonstrated has a minimum of a 15 minute delay. Um, so there's other options. If you set up marketing cloud connect, you'll see other ways to sync uh, within your journey. You'll see events that you can drag on. Um, different entry sources. And recently, MuleSoft has become part of the Salesforce family, and we have existing customers using MuleSoft to integrate cross-cloud or even outside of the Salesforce ecosystem. Great, and another question for you, Dave. Um, Hi guys, great lecture. I have to cross over from Sales Cloud and Marketing Cloud a lot for my job and haven't been able to do much in Marketing Cloud. What are some tutorials or resources that you would recommend for newbie Salesforce developers? So specifically developer, developers, I'll keep pointing you, and I find myself a lot on, on the developer.salesforce.com, but a lot of new trailheads have come out, which is great. I wish they were there when I first started here. Um, just to get a high level, if you're new to the marketing cloud, a high level on um, kind of more marketing cloud specific use cases. But then when you do decide what you want to move forward with in the marketing cloud, then the, the developer APIs are a great resource. Great, thanks Dave. I've got a few questions here for Don. Can you put dynamic content blocks, or regular content blocks for that matter, into custom code? This would allow us to customize our emails with HTML and AMP script, but allow our marketing team to create content blocks that we could place in our code instead of having them manipulate HTML. Uh, yes, you can absolutely do that. Uh, as I mentioned, it's, it's really um, pretty, Pretty, I don't want to say limitless, but there are a few limits on what you can do. If you can um, code it with HTML, JavaScript, AMP script, and your custom block, then uh, you can do it. So you could certainly uh, do something, say, like using AMP script to pull another block inside of your custom block. Do we need to use other tools, or can we do this in the Trailhead platform for Don? Yeah, you can't do this in a Trailhead account right now. Um, we're working on uh, allowing you to use some standard components to build blocks, uh, but right now it's basically just building a web application outside of any marketing cloud or Salesforce cloud um, and deploying that somewhere like Heroku and then uh, deploying it to or um, pulling it into your marketing cloud account. And is the Google Maps block available in the SDK? Uh, yes. So in the SDK, um, there is a sample block and the sample is that Google Maps block that I showed. So uh, it has the link to the GitHub repo for that block, and there's also a link to a sample um, text block uh, that was also in my account in that demo, but I, I didn't show it. Got it. And can we download custom blocks from App Exchange? Uh, you you can. Uh, there are there's only one partner block out there that's been approved so far. Uh, there's one more coming soon. Uh, but we do have uh, internally blocks, de internally developed blocks uh, in the works uh, that we'll be adding to a section of App Exchange called Salesforce Labs. 
and that will be for free blocks that we don't necessarily ship as a, a standard block in Content Builder, but anyone can add to their account. Are there any uh, training material or in-depth developer documentation on Content Block SDK? Uh, yes, it's there's a link uh, in this deck that everyone will be able to have access to. Uh, but also, if you just go to the Salesforce developer site uh, and go to the Marketing Cloud section in there, you'll see a uh, it's a section called Extend Content Builder, and it has all of the uh, developer documentation as well as links to the SDK and sample blocks. Great. Thanks, Don. Um, we have some a few questions here for Alan. Um, Alan, can you tell us a little bit more about the pilot program that you were talking about for um, a company or developers? Yeah, sure. So um, we are currently running a pilot program and we are looking for people who already have a marketing cloud account but might have some greenfield opportunities or an opportunity to consider a new use case and sees value in um, the features that we're creating with these new APIs such as uh, webhooks and the messaging key functionality. So um, if you have an account and a use case that you think you'd like to give this a test run, uh, again, please work with your uh, account rep to, uh, and we'll have a conversation. Great, thanks. When the external third-party system does um, knows neither the subscriber key of the consumer on Marketing Cloud nor the email address, what would be the best practice here? How could we relate the transactional data to data on MC? Um, cause in, uh, in this case, we use queries to join this data. It does not become real time or knowing the subscriber key or email ID in the third party system as a minimum requirement here. Yeah, so um, when we talk about transactional sending, the expectation is, is that that third party system has the awareness either of the existing subscriber key or um, some manifestation of an identifier that the system share or it immediately inherits the, the way to contact the recipient. So example, a point of sale uh, machine will, when you enter your email address and you say, send me a receipt, that, that information has been provided at the time of the transaction. So it is best practice to have those identifiers. Um, however, uh, you know, it, it, it could be worth exploring this um, further uh, to see if there's any other ways to optimize, but currently, uh, subscriber key and or email address is the most optimized way. Got it. I know that you can send a triggered send definition through REST, but is there a REST method available that will allow users, will allow sends through user initiated sends that allow sends to a data extension or a list? If not, is this planned for a future release? Yeah, and I can answer that in two parts, both near term and long term. Um, in the near term, you can set up an activity in Journey Builder through APIs, and you can have it send against a list in that way using the interaction endpoints. Uh, and that's the more near term, um, albeit maybe not as direct as just saying send against this list. Now, that being said, we do have an investment in making uh, more simplified list sends as part of our suite of APIs and messaging. And so we are currently thinking through um, what would that take to, to make a great experience? Does the marketing cloud integrate with Heroku Shield Postgres? Um, I, I, I don't have an answer for that one. Um, Heroku Shield Postgres. I, I would, unfortunately, I, I don't know if Don or uh, Dave have, a, have an answer to that as well, but um, I'm not familiar with Heroku Shield Postgres. Okay, we could find out and, um, and get back to you. Um, next question, this is for Dave. Are there any scenarios where you would not need to configure Contact Builder data model to use Journey Builder? Yes, there's certainly customers that don't use the Contact Builder data model. Um, where you might run into limitations is, let's say you want to do a decision split. Uh, as I mentioned, like on an abandoned cart, and we don't know how that's related because you haven't related it via con contact builder, but you don't have to use it. You could use a query activity to simply write SQL if you're more comfortable writing SQL, but you just don't get the drag and drop um, kind of UI editor to build your SQL. Um, really, all you need is a data extension. So that was the step one, climbing the mountain of the data, data model. Set up your data extension. You don't necessarily need to relate that into context to get a, a journey up and running. Great. 
How easy is it to promote journeys between sandbox business units and other business units? Uh, I would say it's for I would say it's hard, and for this group, uh, easy. <laughs> um, the you you will journeys just like the data model are accessible via the API, so you can inspect the you can read the journeys that are set up in one business unit. I've seen customers do this, and then have then write that same journey out to another business unit. Thing to, things to look out for is it's not just the journey you need set up in both in both business units, so the, the sandbox business unit and the other. It's also the data. Uh, um, it's it's the content. You know, every piece. It depends how complicated that journey is. But let's say that journey is sending an email. Make sure everything needed to send that email is going from one business unit to the other. Great. Um, is there a way to set up a data extension that creates a record based on actions done in the journey? Yes, um, so I assume that's for me. Um, so yes, uh, I've seen that as well. Uh, so people can set up a data extension either via the API or via the UI, uh, and then you can drag in activities onto the journey, journey and we've had people uh, use that to, to log what's happening in the journey. You know, if they want to extend beyond our logging capabilities today um, to write uh, maybe for their records on Maybe they're doing some A/B testing, see which which path of the journey was more successful. But it's it's certainly possible. Great. And can we access and test these APIs in a developer org? Uh, so the developer org, that's more on the sales and service side. So we're going to uh, for the API access um, for the marketing cloud now. Um, that's a developer orgs is, is more of a sales and service concept where you're going to find business units uh, on the marketing cloud side. All right. Um, and I think that's all we have for the questions here. So I want to be I want to thank all of the presenters for their time today. Um, and if we did not get to your specific question, um, please reach out to us in the forum, which is at developer.salesforce.com slash forum. Or you can click on the community tab and click on forum. Thank you so much for joining us, and we hope you enjoy the rest of your day.